I know a lot of people say I believe in Christmas but I don't believe in miracles you see like you watch deliverance you're like man that that's fake well then Christmas is fake everything about Christmas is supernatural it's miraculous and if you believe in Christmas you believe in miracles amen and so we believe that miracles will happen miracles are happening and that God wants to do great and wonderful things in our midst for his glory and for our good amen I want to share with you a message today I'm gonna open the scriptures in Matthew read the verse about the birth of Jesus Christ Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 and it says the following and she will bring forth a son and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins you will call his name what and all my Latino friends say what Jesus you will call his name Jesus and what is he gonna do it doesn't say here and he will give you a new holiday to celebrate it says that he will save his people any of his people we have in this house this afternoon somebody say I am his people he will save his people from their sins I want to share with you today the reason for this season the real reason for Christmas the real reason for Jesus coming on this earth it is not to give us a holiday time just to be with the family that, that those are byproducts but the real reason why he came is outlined in this verse he will save his people from their sins the story that I want to take to break down of what I mean by save his people from their sins is from Genesis the very story that many of you are familiar I think every religion in the world has some kind of a history of a worldwide flood and in Genesis chapter 6 verse 11 I'm going to read from the message message translation it says God said to Noah it's over it's the end of a human race violence is everywhere I'm making a clean sweep build yourself a ship from teak wood and make rooms in it coat it with pitch inside and out make it 450 feet long 75 feet wide and 45 feet high build a roof for it and put a window 18 inch from the top and put a door on the side of the ship and make three decks lower middle and upper and God says I'm gonna bring the flood on the earth and will destroy everything alive under heaven total destruction but I'm going to establish a covenant with you. You will board the ship and your sons, your wife and your son's wives will come on board with you. You will also take two of each living creatures, male and female on board the ship to preserve the lives with you. Two from every species of birth, mammal and reptile, two of everything so that to preserve their lives as long as others. And you will also get food that you will need and store up for you and for them. I want to take this story today to pretty much bring into the explanation of what Jesus, pretty much why Jesus came and was born on, uh, on the earth. Definitely we know that he wasn't born on the 24th, 25th of December, uh, but uh, we know that one of the popes in opposition to the heathen holiday of celebration of God the Son he created that to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ but for us for those of you who say well Christmas is a pagan holiday um, pretty sure the jeans you wear had some kind of a pagan origin as well so uh, with us we redeem every everything we can for to glorify God if we can take Christmas to celebrate Jesus I'm taking it you know everything that we can do to, to if, if we can go in the mall and, and hear songs about Jesus during this season come on that's a win that, that's a win and if more people buy things for their friends and their family that's a win people say oh there's so much comer comer uh, yeah when a lot of commercialization of Christmas you know what if people are spending more and buying gifts for other people that's a good thing that's not a bad thing amen and so God bless you for those of you who are getting gifts and for those of you who are not you have the greatest gift life and Jesus Christ amen flood evil violence wickedness holy God comes to the earth and says um, bad really really bad and tells Noah I'm gonna wipe everything out I want you to build a cruise ship gives him dimensions 
gives him how to build that ship from a particular type of wood, coat it with asphalt or coat it with a particular type of a coat in the, in the, in the uh, in, in and the outside. He says make one window, make one door and then make three decks in it, put animals in it, put some food in it and God says for I'm gonna wipe the earth and everybody's gonna die but I want you to live. Uh, Noah goes to work, takes him I think 100 something years to build that big ship and then at the end he goes inside. Now <laughs> reason with me, God comes to Noah and says I'm gonna save you from the flood that he himself caused. God is saving Noah from God. Looks like that. He's telling him build a ship so I can save you from my own wrath my own judgment my, my own flood sometimes when we come to people and we say things like hey are you saved and you know I had one person respond from what I'm like I don't know I mean bad stuff no <laughs> like when I ask you a question are you saved you know your automatic reasoning has to be from what now when we are when we get saved the Bible says we're saved from our sins when we get saved what are we saved from as Christians now typically people say well I'm saved from hell meaning I'm saved from going to hell other people say I'm saved from the devil some people say I am saved from my sin but in the Bible in the context of the Bible what was Noah being saved from Noah was being saved by a ship from the wrath of God that God poured out on the earth this may sound a little confusing for some of us but when you're saved you're actually saved by God from God no, it's not that God is bipolar or have multiple personality disorder. God just one day like loves you and then the other day wants to hit you and then he's like, hey, just get protected. Why? Because I don't know what mood I'm going to be in. <laughs> that is not that. God is not unstable in his mood. God does not have mood swings and God does not have these problems. God is a holy God. He is very stable and he is just God. And his justice demands that sin is punished. And trust me, we all want a just God. The only time we don't want God to be just is when we're the ones in trouble it's kind of like same thing we all want police to be just right you don't want police officers presidents governors to be corrupt why even if they are doing something that causing you pain like giving you a ticket you still want them to be just you don't want God that's not just but the problem with that is that just God he punishes sin and in this case he is punishing the whole world but he's making an ark and says, Noah, I want you to hide in this ark. From who? Not the devil, not demons, the wrath of God. Yeah. As a Christian, when you are saved, you are saved from the wrath of God. You are saved from the wrath of God. God is holy and God is just and he wants to hide you in the ark of his grace. In the ark of his son Jesus Christ, in the ark of the gospel which is made out of the cross just like this ark was made out of wood. The gospel, the good news is made out of the fact that Jesus died. He took the punishment of God meaning the flood, the way the flood hit the ark. It beat on the ark and the ark endured the flood it endured the wrath of God but Noah on inside with his family was protected and shielded from the flood because the flood hit the ark but it never hit Noah God wants the same thing to believe in Jesus in the gospel since Jesus got hit with the wrath of God and I am in Jesus I am protected from being punished for my sins my friends God is not in the business of throwing us life jackets to swim through the flood. See many people think Christianity or salvation is God giving you a ticket like a spare tire, insurance car, Geico that you you know can save 15% or more on your insurance. Salvation is not an insurance card. Salvation is not a life vest where you are over there drowning in your sin and God is in heaven throws in a line and says make it try to make it to the other side the problem with life jacket is it can't protect you from the rain 
it can only protect you from drowning but it cannot keep you alive for 40 days it cannot nourish you God doesn't give us life jacket salvations meaning like pray a sinner's prayer I'm gonna put your name there somewhere and try to make it till the end God gives us an ark a ship a gospel grace Jesus Christ and he invites us in he says I want you to come inside be in my son and then you will be sheltered from my wrath you will be protected from the consequences of your sin you will be shielded from also the demonic influences few things I want you to notice about the ark that relate to Jesus Christ one is the ark was a shelter from the flood Jesus Christ is the protection from the wrath of God one father with his son was riding a wagon and there was a fire that cut up on the fields and everything was burning and as they were trying to escape from the fire and get ahead of the fire they got a little bit ahead of the fire the father parked the horse and the wagon and he realized that there is no way they can escape because the fire was everywhere the father took fire started a fire and burned piece of the field that the fire was about to come to he set that field on fire once that field burned out he made a little um uh like a um uh, canava little ditch little ditch <laughs> wow it's crazy my russian russian word came into my mind usually i don't think in russian no more he 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 dug a little ditch around the place where he just sat on fire and put his son the horse and the wagon right in the middle of that burnt place and the raging fire is everywhere coming in his son looks at his dad and says dad we're gonna die this fire is coming from everywhere and it's like really really high and his dad looked at him and he said son trust me we're not gonna die and when the fire already came to where the ditch was his son held close to his dad and said dad we're surely gonna die the fire is everywhere and the father told him he says the secret is to always stand where the fire has been because the fire cannot burn that place twice and the fire quickly passed around them and went on see when you stand in what Jesus did on the cross the fire of God's wrath went through Jesus and when you stand in the finished work of God's cross that fire can no longer touch you because it already touched him that's why in the Old Testament when Israel had blood over their houses God says when I see the blood I will pass over you that means something already died it wasn't your died it was the animal that died and so that you will no longer be punished for your sin because the animal took the punishment and see my friends I don't believe we're just forgiven our sins were paid for the reason we are going to heaven is not because our sins were just removed they were paid for and therefore we will not be punished twice we have Passover God will pass over us judgment will pass over us guilt will pass over us that's why I don't believe that I need to carry the consequences of my sin Jesus did that on the cross I am in the ark of God's grace. I am in the ark of Jesus' gospel. Jesus took the beating. Jesus took the shame. Jesus took the rejection. Jesus took God's displeasure. Jesus took God's rejection. And I am in Jesus. So I can live in God's acceptance. I can live in God's forgiveness. I can live in God's grace and God's peace. Somebody say amen. You know, ark was also covered with asphalt. The interesting part is the word asphalt or pitch is the same word that's used to cover or to make atonement. What ark was covered with on the inside and the outside is the same word that is used in the Bible to make atonement, meaning to cover someone's sin. See, Jesus' grace is waterproofed, moisture-proofed. When he covers us nothing can get through us none of that can get through us ark was not only that but ark had three decks as our god god the father son and the holy spirit the same way when we accept god's grace we accept the triune god 
we accept Jesus into our life. But I want you to notice that Noah was a good man, yet he still needed the ark. Noah, Bible says, a righteous man in comparison with evil people. But he wasn't righteous enough to escape the judgment. The only way he could avoid judgment is to be in the ark. In comparison with his society, Noah was good. But when God compared himself with Noah, said, Noah, your goodness is not enough that you can flow through the flood. Your goodness will not save you. You still need to get inside of the ark. I want to tell each person here today, you might consider yourself very good and you probably are very righteous compared to your bad friends. Everybody in here is righteous. If you compare yourself to someone like Hitler, Stalin or other people who are in jail. But the problem that happens is that your righteousness is not good enough in comparison to God. And therefore even if you think you're good, you still need the ark because no matter how good you are, you cannot last in the flood on your own. Now for example, let's just say that you're a fast swimmer. I recently picked up a swimming lessons and on, um, on Fridays I tried to go and, and learn to swim. I know how to swim. I just, I swim like, um, yeah I don't know how to swim <laughs> professionally. You, you know how people like put their head into the water and they go like easily, yeah I can't do that. When I put my head into the water we have problems and so I want to learn how to swim like better just for my physical uh, and for endurance and everything and so let's just say that for a moment that me Benji and Gilbert are gonna set to swim to Hawaii now how many of you know that I could say let's say for a moment that Benji is faster than two of us it just simply means that Benji will last longer in the water and die last it doesn't mean he'll reach Hawaii. So just because he's better than us, it still does not mean he's gonna swim to Hawaii. See just because you're better than your neighbor, it doesn't mean you can reach heaven. You can't reach Hawaii by swimming. You can only reach there by flying or by a boat. Same thing with heaven. You cannot reach heaven by your good works. You can measure your good works with your neighbor, but you, it will never be good enough to reach God. That's why God came to a good man. Noah the righteous man and says Noah you are a good man you are have favor with me but Noah you still need to be in the ark can I speak to all of those people who grew up Catholic you still need salvation can I speak to those people who grew up in Christian families you still need salvation can I speak to those who got baptized in the church at a little young age and got dedicated to God you still need salvation can I speak to those who give to Red Cross and other charities during Christmas and they don't smoke, drink, get high or hang out with those that do. You still need salvation. You still need Jesus. You still need the ark. You may say but I am doing good. That's only in reference to your friends and your neighbors. But God came to a good man and said bro you still need the ark. Now for those of us here today please don't be, imagine Noah has the ark in his backyard and says, God, I have the ark. That's not what's going to get you saved, Noah. Having the ark parked in your backyard like a boat in your driveway doesn't get you saved. Noah had to get inside of the ark. My friends, knowing about Jesus, knowing about God, having read the Bible from beginning to end, not missing one mass all your life and honoring Virgin Mary, admiring the Pope, good Christian morals and having it park in your backyard is not the same thing as having yourself located in the ark. Your heart, your life given over to Jesus Christ. My Bible makes me to understand demons believe in God and they go they get scared. When we pray for deliverance we see when demons are very very scared. You know the interesting part about demons? They're still demons. You know the interesting part about demons? They're still going to hell. So believing that God exists and even coming to church and uh, oh holy night. You're like goosebumps. I felt it. I felt it. That is awesome. That means the ark is in your backyard. It's really close. But my friend feeling God's presence, trembling before God, 
and repenting of your sin and placing your trust in Jesus are not the same. It's like having the ark in your backyard but never being inside. And I want to invite some of you today who have ark parked in your backyard. Listen, it's time to get inside. Having the ark doesn't save you. Being in the ark does. The ark, not only it was covered with asphalt, the ark not only it protected from the flood, the ark not only good people have to go into it as well but it's interesting because nowhere in here do I see that the ark had a rudder, a captain, an anchor or some kind of a controlling mechanism that controlled the ship. Every ship, airplane, cars, bicycles for crying out loud has brakes. I mean rollerblades have brakes. Everything that's moving and carrying you has a way to control itself. Ark had no control system. When Noah got inside he's pretty much depended on the ark to take him where the ark goes. Now it is very dangerous to do that with the ship but it's not very dangerous to do that with gospel. Because when you trust yourself into the gospel you may say but I lose control. God becomes the one in control. He becomes your captain, he becomes your pilot, a co-pilot, co-captain, he becomes your rudder, he becomes your anchor, he becomes your guiding system. That's the most beautiful part about grace is he's the one that carries you, he's the one that guides you and he's the one that leads you. You don't control him, he's the one that leads you. Can somebody say amen? I want you to see this about Ark. So Ark is symbolic of God's grace. God's grace, Jesus on the cross, Jesus bo born, Jesus dying protects me from the wrath of God. But the ark, I want you to notice that it had only one door. We read in here, it says that God says, I want you to put a door on the side of the ship. Ark, you would think it would have a humongous ship, 450 feet long, would have more than one door. I mean my, my house is 1,900 something square feet. And it has front door, back door and the garage and a little chimney in case doors don't work. Ark had no other door except one door. All the animals, all the people have to go through one door. You know why I believe this is speaking about Jesus? Because I believe the gospel only has one door too. Jesus says, I am the door to the sheep. Jesus Christ is the door to God's grace. I know uh, what's his name said the guy who just really uh, the famous guy who released the movie George Lucas said when I remember when I was 10 years of age I asked my mother if there is only one God why are there so many religions I've been pondering on that question ever since and the conclusion that I came to is that all religions are true he's a really brilliant director but this statement is really dumb because Buddhism believes there's no God Hinduism believes in a thousand of them. Judaism believes in one. Islam believes in one and Christianity believes in one God but in three persons. They all cannot be true. That's like saying one plus one is two and one plus one is three and one plus one is four. All the answers are correct. It doesn't work with math and it doesn't work with faith. Madonna says, I do believe that all all religions they lead to the same God. It's a shame that we end up having so many religious wars because they all are the same. Madonna stick with music but uh, that's not really true. I know 60% of our generation believes that all religions are really much the same. Now it's true I agree with you. All there are different ways to God. Different ways. You can go to God because somebody evangelized to you in the mall. You can get to God because you had a very tragic thing that happened to you and you realize God is real. There's many ways to God but there is only one door to salvation. And that door is Jesus Christ. An ark did not have a chimney. An ark did not have a garage. An ark did not have a back door, the front door. It did not have a tunnel underneath. An ark had only one door and either Jesus is a liar when he said I am the door or Jesus is crazy or Jesus is who he said he is. Now I respect the movie directors. I respect the famous, brilliant, talented, great people but you must understand one thing about these people. They are people. They're still going to die. 
Jesus said what he said. He had 600 prophecies before he came. He walked on water. Demons obeyed his voice. Nature obeyed his voice. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He was nice. He was kind. He said he will die. He did. He rose from the dead. Honestly, anybody who pulls that off has my vote. If you're gonna pull that off, I'll be your first follower. I will abandon every faith I have and I'll follow you. If you can match his resume, all of the other guys, they don't match it. And that is why we are so crazy to believe in what Jesus said. It makes us controversial. People will call us narrow-minded. You guys believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. You know why? Because he's the only one that paid for our sins. The ark has only one door. Salvation has only one door. That door is Jesus Christ. Amen. Does that mean that we're pushing other people out? That's not what God meant. God wasn't trying to push everybody out by making one door. God is not someone that excludes other people. He includes everyone who will come to Him. But we must acknowledge Jesus to be the truth. I want to remind each person that the door that God made available, it was open for at least 120 years. When Noah was building it, the door was open. And after that time, it says, I think in chapter 7, that God invited Noah and then God shut the door. Jesus Christ is the door. But this door will not be open forever. One day God will shut the door. In Matthew it says of five foolish virgins who came in and the door was shut before them. Two ways the doors get shut. One of them is Jesus comes back. Or second way is when you and I, we die. The second way is more likely to happen to us than the first one. When I was younger, I was so scared of Jesus coming any moment. And then I realized that for 2,000 years, all Christians, you know, a lot of times use the scare tactic on little kids. You know, don't sin, don't do anything bad. Why? Because Jesus will come while you're doing it. And then uh, I overcame that fear realizing probably He's not coming anytime soon. But the part that changed my life is about 10 to 11 years of age. We were, uh, two of my neighbors were our best, we were our best friends, we were three of us best friends. Three of us were from believing families. In Ukraine we had to take a bus to school, walk to the bus. It took us about 40 minutes to actually get to school on the bus. And my parents didn't drop us off. <laughs> this wasn't part of parenting that they had. I remember one time we we're about to go to school and a neighbor of ours was fixing his car and he says, hey kiddos, I'll take you, I'll give you a lift. It was the happiest day of, of our week to be able to have extra 25 minutes to do absolutely nothing. And so I remember with backpacks we're waiting, he's changing oil in his car and he said he'll give us a lift. So we're young, enthusiastic, backpacks on. The neighbor, one of my friends, three of us, he had this a swing in his front yard. The yard the driveway, the, the driveway had asphalt everywhere and the swings that we had is not like the ones we have in the park in here where it's like made out of like some kind of a rubber and you swing and there's grass. These swings were like made by like Soviets. So they're, they're, they're first of all they were metal. Um, then they had benches there where you can actually sit and it was so firmly attached to the asphalt in the driveway that you can swing that thing so high, like dangerously high. You could actually go 360 which we never attempted to that because we didn't have enough courage and so I remember this we we have 25 minutes to spare not enough time to play soccer so we got into the swing and between the beam that held the swing and the asphalt there was maybe this much space so we got in and the deal was this one person sits and enjoys and two other help to create the flow so the two others stood on the bench. I'm sitting and they're creating, you know, pushing it so that the swing goes up, pushing it down, that it goes up. And then we pick up speed, the speed and we're screaming, ah! It's so exciting. And then we decide to help each other out so that I don't just enjoy the swing, I help to push the, you know, push the swing higher. So we decide to switch. I'm sitting on the bench and my friend, 
he's standing on the bench and as we are switching I'm grabbing the swing and he's trying to grab the seat but the problem is the swing is going up so as he's grabbing the seat he's letting it go and he falls he falls right in the middle and the swing in the full force is coming back and it has this much space and so at the age of 10 and 11 this is where I saw my friend's skull half of it removed right in front of my eyes and so he died we didn't have therapy at that time or somebody you know talk to us say hey you know how do you deal with it I, I was speechless for a week I couldn't sleep really well couldn't think really well the how graphic that was it wasn't what scared me the most it was the fact that with the backpack on my back we were planning to go to school none of us were planning to have a funeral in three days none of us but the door of salvation the door of opportunity was shut for my friend without notification I have this thing on my phone where it lets me know I'm using only 15 minutes of a social media and after 10 minutes is used you get this reminder five minutes left and then you quickly you know trying to finish everything because you got five minutes left and then you get one more minute extra if you want to use it I want to tell you something when the door of salvation shuts God doesn't give us warnings I look at people sometimes and I, I used to grieve when I heard that people knew that they had six months to live from eternity point of view when you know that you have six months left that's a privilege because you have six months to reevaluate your life and to think about your future but I want to tell you something most of you you're so healthy you're so good God will not give you that postcard the door will be shut without you knowing and that's why it's always good to be on the inside of the ark when it gets shut not on the outside and I want to just encourage each person here in this room today maybe for this reason you came to church today 2,000 years ago God built an ark Jesus became the door and Jesus is the only one that can bring you salvation but this door that is wide open right now and you may think I have a lot of time I thought the same thing with my friend but after that incident with my friend I live with the fresh reality that honestly getting in the car today and going home it could be my last day it could be and I don't live with paranoia and fear that I'm gonna die but at the same time I live with the awareness that eternity doesn't wait for me when I turn 90. Eternity stands with me right now and this split second and every step I take eternity is next step just one step and I will be there and I will breathe my last and this makes me not be afraid but live with urgency to fulfill God's call respond to the gospel and live for God's purpose. Can somebody say amen? Let's put our hands together for the Lord. Ark had one door. Ark also had only one window. I believe it speaks of the Bible. Ark only had one window through which the air and light come in. Through the door Noah entered into the ark. But through the window I want you to see who exited the ark. The dove exited the ark. See when you have Jesus you enter into grace, you enter into salvation, you enter into the gospel. Your sins can be forgiven of you. You don't have to pay for your sins because Jesus did that. But see the ark did not only have one door, the ark also had one window. This speaks of the Bible. What is windows for? Windows are for the light to come in and for the air to come in, right? When it gets stuffy in the house, you ask somebody could anybody please open the window why so that the air can come in and get out if you are a Christian today you have placed your trust in Jesus Christ you've trusted in God's grace I want to tell you something to keep your Christian life cool and not stuffy it's the window you have to open the window meaning you have to open the Bible when you open your heart to Jesus he gives you salvation when you open your Bible to yourself he gives you transformation when you open the door you get inside of the ark but when you open the Bible the dove the Holy Spirit begins to flow he begins to move in your life brings you freshness and brings you grace into your life there was a new study that was done by this particular company they said that someone who reads the scripture four or, or more times a week 
looks radically different from the life of someone who does not. In fact, the lives of Christians who do not engage in the Bible most days of the week are statistically the same as the lives of unbelievers. You may say, but how could it be? I believe in Jesus. I am saved. It's very simple. If your house never gets fresh air, it will stink. You will be alive, but really, really sick. If your Christian life only believes in what Jesus did on the cross, in His grace, but you never open the window in the ark called the Bible, you will get stuffy. It will stink in that house because of all the gases that are released. Someone who engages in the Bible four or more times a week and behind me is the statistic is 228 times more likely to share their faith with others. 407 times more likely to memorize scriptures. 59 times less likely to view pornography and 30% less likely to struggle with loneliness. In other words, if you open the window, fresh air is going to come in. See some of you Christians, therapy is important, counseling is important. Nothing replaces opening the window of the fresh air of God's breath. Nothing replaces opening the Bible and beginning to read the Bible and meditate on the Bible, memorize the Bible, confess the Bible, live the Bible and obey the Bible. Can somebody say amen? I just want to challenge each one of you. Maybe a little bit less Facebook, a little bit more face into this book. Maybe a little bit less of Pinterest, maybe a little bit less of Instagram, maybe a little bit less of Lincoln, maybe a little bit less of other stuff and open this window in your house. If your spiritual life is stuffed up, if your spiritual life is heavy, if your spiritual life stinks, if your spiritual life is not good, make a decision. Memorize one verse a week. Read few chapters every day. Speak the word. Live in the word. Something will begin to happen. Your life will get a fresh air fresh air. Now some of you will say Vlad but it's an old book. I like to read new books. Have you realized the sun is old? Still hot. Still has light. This book is different than any other books. You know how I know that? Because no other book communists wanted to burn in former Soviet Union. They didn't want to burn the books of other Christians. They didn't want to burn the books of Buddhism, Hinduism. They didn't want to burn the books of, of Muslim. They wanted to burn this book. Why? Because that's the only book that's a threat. If this book is just another book, explain to me why they tried to wipe it out of the planet. Explain to me why it's the best seller right now in the United States. Most books get bought, no more book than this one. If this book is just nothing, why there's so much persecution against this book? This book has life. This book is the window and if you open it, air will come in, light will come in. And any other light that doesn't come from this book becomes deception and becomes illusion. This light, that's why everything is Christians. And people say an angel came to me. I had a vision at night and everything. If it didn't come through this window, every light in the ark came through only one window. Every revelation in the Christian's life doesn't come from angels, dreams or somebody visited you. It came from the word of God. That's why Joseph Prince started a new religion of Mormonism because he had an angel that came to him. He got light that didn't come from this book. That's how Muhammad started a new religion because he had a light that didn't come from the book. As Christians all of our enlightenment comes through one window. It's the Bible. And the beautiful part when you have this window that is the only window you use to see the world outside. We look at the world through the book. We don't look at the Bible through our culture. Culture has changed. The values in our culture has changed. And many Christians today go back and they edit the Bible because they look at the Bible through the culture. We look at the culture through the Bible. It's the other way around. Can somebody say amen? Not only the ark had one door, ark had one window, but inside ark had one family. Say one family. In the ark there was only one family and this family speaks of the church. Everyone in the ark was one family. Divide of race, divide of politics, wealth is replaced by the unity of brotherhood in Christ. One of the beautiful parts if you're visiting us for the first time in our church is that you see different cultures. 
you see different colors in here you see different ethnic ethnic backgrounds in here and you see different ages one of the big shockers that people get is what is this young guy doing on the stage I remember I went to one of our uh, men in our church to his business and and his secretary met met me and she says hey are you the pastor I said um yes she says aren't you too young to be a pastor I almost said it aren't you too old to be a secretary but I was like Jesus help me, help me. I have these very mean comebacks and without the Holy Spirit I can get a lot of trouble and I was like I was like yeah I'm growing the beard trying to be uh trying to look wiser and older but it's true uh, I might look very young one of our dear brothers uh, is Hispanic he's older and he speaks English with difficulty and he walked away from the Lord for many times the church he used to attend to a long time ago his pastor found him in town and says hey Armando you, you're going back to church he said yes he says he said did you look yourself in the mirror he said yes why he says you're Mexican what are you doing in the Russian church and he said I did not know it was Russian <laughs> he said they have more Mexicans than Russians there <laughs> he says I don't go to church because it's Mexican I go to church because it's Christian my friends when you are in God's grace racism has no place racism and I know some of you come here today and you hear people with accents you watch the video you're like man what is going on with this church like everybody has an accent and then like 20 people have an accent on the on the thing get used to it because heaven will be a very very unique place and English is not going to be the dominant language it's not going to be and nor is Ukrainian and nor is the Spanish language and so I want to really remind each one of us that as a church God wants what we see in our church to happen in every church where people from different cultures people from different colors and different ages make up one family in the ark of God in the grace of God anytime I travel people come up to me and they say how is it possible that you're from Ukrainian descent married a Russian wife and FYI both of our countries are at war right now in fact the war is so real the Tri-Cities Herald did a top cover uh, news article one time me and my wife took a photo right here we were sitting and they put this thing on the top of the article house divided my Slavic friends who don't speak English started to spread rumors that I'm getting divorced <laughs> my wife is Russian I'm Ukrainian and for those of you who don't know what that is that's two different cultures who are currently at war and so for those of you who may be coming and saying you know what that's just the Russian church we actually have very little of Russian people here there's a little bit more of Ukrainians there are people here from different countries and different cultures we have people on the staff who are from different cultures and different backgrounds we have people who are life group leaders who are board of our trustees we are very colorful church and we love that I really want us as a church not to be a racist church but to embrace other races to embrace other cultures and this whole racism thing has to be gone because we are washed with the same blood we have the same father and we are each other's brothers and sisters hey this is pastor vlad and thank you for watching this sermon please click on the subscribe so that you can be a part of our hungry generation youtube community and click on the bell as well so that you can be notified when we upload the new sermon Thank you for watching and God bless you.